on previous videos I spoke about inductors that they are just a piece of wire that is coiled. Also spoke that when you have electron flow on a wire it creates a magnetic field. As a reminder, inductor fields got poles and there was this left hand rule that it tells us which way the North Pole points to. When current starts flowing through the inductor, immediately when it gets energized, current is very minimal. So not much current flows. Then the field starts slowly building up. As the field builds up, more current starts flowing through the inductor. When the field gets to a maximum point, then current is maximum and then at that point on current will be flowing through the inductor as max as maximum as the allow the wire will allow. So to summarize it, we can say that an inductor initially opposes current flow when it's first energized. If we remove the current that is creating the inductor, what happens is that the inductor starts collapsing. And as it starts collapsing, it, can, it has stored energy. That stored energy of the field starts creating an electron flow that it is on the same direction or of the same direction of the original current flow that created the inductor. When the inductor is discharged, then there is no current flow. It's just a piece of wire that is just without power. Because inductors store energy, at least for a very short period of time, they are used as filters to the load, and that is whenever we want voltage to be very constant on the load, and we put AC signals, even if we I pass the signal AC through a rectifier, what we still have a pulsating AC, which I haven't talked about what pulsating AC is, but the inductor will help out to smooth out some of those pulsations. But for right now, just press the I believe button. I will talk about this more in the future. When you place an inductor into AC, and this is supposed to be AC symbol, so as you already know, AC electrons are flowing back and forth. Every time that electrons change directions, the inductor will slow down the electrons or will act as a resistance. The resistance that the inductor produ produces is actually called inductive reactance. Inductance reactance is represented by an X with a little L, and it is calculated by the formula 2 pi FL, where F is frequency and L is the inductance of the conductor. Frequency is measured in hertz and inductance in henrys. The inductance is depending on the wire length, the wire thickness that makes the coil, the, how many turns it is, um, the type of wire, the actual thickness, you know, whether the coils are small or they are big, uh, the spacing between the coils, and a few other things. That it really is determined by the manufacturer, so that is a value that is given to us. Frequency for our regular distribution systems in the US and board ships will always be 60 Hz unless there is a special frequency which that was, is also given to you. And this circuit over here, if I were to have an inductor that has an inductance of 0.2652 and a standard frequency of 60 and pi the number is always given to us by the calculator we could get a resistance of 100 ohms just by doing that calculation to better understand 
calculations for inductors. I set up this basic schematic where I have a source of power, which is AC, and then 60 hertz, 120 volts. And I'm going to be powering in parallel a heater, a light, an inductor, and I got a current of 2 amps, 1 amp, and 9 amps. And we want to find out the total resistance of this system. And also we're going to get uh, what is the inductor um, value for this particular coil. Just to be clear, when I say the word coil, coil is just a piece of wire that is just coiled, and that's what an inductor it is. So, yeah, we're going to find out the inductor value and the resistance of the total circuit. And, but, but for that, we're going to need to find out the re resistance of this one, which is not called resistance, but it's called reactance. But it is treated as resistance when we, once we get that value. So here I wrote the Ohm's law E equals IR. If you don't know what this is, please watch our video for Ohm's law. Now, so the voltage is given to us. This is a parallel system. So I got 100 volts over 110 volts over here, which means I got 110 volts over here, which means I got 110 volts over here because voltage is common in a parallel circuit, which is this is. So I'm going to write down that if I'm going to focus on the heater, the voltage to it is 110 volts. So for the heater, I got 110 volts. That's equal to the current for the heater is given to me. So I'm writing 9 amps because that's what's given to us. What we don't know is our resistance. After rearranging the equation, I find out that the resistance for the heater in this case is 12.2 ohms. When we go over to the lamp, well, we also got 110 volts to it. So for the lamp circuit, I got 110 volts. And the current through that branch is 1 amp. That's what I put in. And resistance is what I don't know. Once I rearrange my equation, 110 volts divided by 1 amp, it gives me 110 ohms. So the light has a resistance of 110 ohms. Now the inductor, I went ahead and cleared the other values so I have more space. But like I was saying, for the inductor, well, we got the same scenario, 110 volts. But now that branch has only 2 amps. Let me rearrange the equation. So I end up with 10 divided by 2 amps, or 110 volts divided by 2 amps, equals 55 ohms. So I got an inductance of 55 ohms reactance, which is also uh, expressed in ohms. But the calculations are not over yet. We still want to find out what the inductance is. And this is what we're looking for. We have the frequency, which is common, and we got the reactance, which is 55 ohms. After replacing my values on the equation, I leave obviously the L, and then rearranging the equation for L, I get this, and the answer, or inductance, actually we end up with a value of 0.149, which is the answer for this. Now, the total resistance for the circuit. So to get the total resistance, we're going to have to use this Ohm's law uh, formula for resistance. And so we're going to have the reactance of the inductor. And we're going to add it to the resistance and of both the light and the heater in this way so that we can get the total resistance of the circuit. And after I replace everything, which I'm not going to show you because this is just basic math, uh, you're going to get this total resistance. Now, to double check my work, well, the total current that goes through here, so some electrons go this way, a total of 2 amps, and some electrons go this way, a total of 1 amp, and some electrons go that way a total of 9 amps. So if I go uh, 
9 plus 1 plus 2, I should have 12 amps going through here. And that means that if I did correctly my calculations, uh, since I could now replace all of this with a big resistor of 9.1 amps, when I do the calculations, I should also get 12 amps, which is what the original circuit was giving me. And when I replace, I get roughly 12.0016 amps, which is the same as whatever I did in the other method where I just added the uh, um, amperage. So definitely checks. So that means that we got effectively our inductance and our total resistance. Now, what happens if the frequency changes? And what happens if we increase the frequency to let's say 400 Hertz? What is that gonna, how is that gonna affect uh, reactants? Well, if you look into it, if I make this number bigger, that means that our reactant is gonna go up. So if we increase our frequency, our reactance is gonna go up. So if we drop our frequency from 60 Hertz, which is normal, to 40 Hertz, that means that our, so by dropping our frequency, our reactance, and this is R, L, will go down. So they are closely related. As an electrician's mate, the most inductors that you're gonna see are gonna be solenoid valves, which are water valves or fluid valves that whenever they get energized, they do, well, use a magnetic property, but the inductors will create a resistance for, uh, to draw a minimum amount of current. You're also seeing contactors, which we will talk about in a future video, and filters to filter out voltages and among other things. To summarize, we can say that inductors, well, they create magnetic fields. They store energy in those fields that they create. They oppose a change in AC current, uh, but in DC current, at the beginning they oppose it, but once the DC current does not change, the electron uh, gets to a maximum current flow. That's the chart that I show you. It was a time against current. And so, yes, they, they, they pass DC voltages. They act just as a piece of wire. And the reactance of a inductant, which is the same thing as a resistance, but it's called reactance, it is calculated by the formula 2 pi frequency times inductance. When talking about inductors, people will say that voltage leads current. And they have these acronyms where E stands for voltage, I for current, and L for inductor, and also for leads. So to easily remember, they just say LE. Now to better explain that, I had this little simple drawing where I got a DC battery. That's what's important about this. I got my open switch, and then the inductor. Originally, when the switch is open, there is no current flow. So therefore, the voltage across this wire or this inductor would be zero volts. The voltage across the light, which is, this is the light, it is zero volts because there is no current flow. However, now down here, it will feel like if there is a positive because all of this is acting as a short, so we're feeling this potential. And then at this point on, we got negative potential. So we have the whole battery power. If this is a 12 volt battery, this will be 12 volts. What we will read in the multimeter. Now, before I proceed, I noticed that I removed the inductor just to make things easier for now. I close the switch. So that therefore, first of all, this is a piece of wire. Since it is a piece of wire, the voltage drop across the same piece of wire is zero volts. The switch, when the switch is closed, is the same thing as a piece of wire, so the voltage drop here is zero volts. 
but we had 12 volts available. That means that the whole 12 volts is coming in and is turning the light on. Since now the light is on, the light is the customer and it is consuming the whole 12 volts. Since now you know how the circuit works without the inductor, now I added the inductor back on and I'm about to turn the switch on. As soon as I turn the switch on, something strange happens. Instead of the light to get the full voltage, immediately the inductor is the one that reads the whole voltage. So the inductor starts right here with whole 12 volts. I'm going to say that this range over here uh, is 12 volts. But there is no current flow, so we are here at zero and the current flow represented by red is zero. As time passes, you're going to notice that the voltage across the inductor is going to start to decrease and it's going to get to what is called a zero point. The current through the inductor is going to start to increase and since this is a series circuit, whatever current that we get through the inductor is going to get through the light and you're going to see it to a maximum point. This is going to happen in what is called phi time constants. On those time constants, what's going to happen is that the voltage is going to drop 66%. Actually, I did make a mistake over here. I should have drew it more like something like this to what I'm trying to indicate that the voltage dropped by 60% and then from that point on, to the next con this time constant to this time constant, it drops another 66%. And then from here to this point, it drops another 66%. So by the time the fifth time constant is over here, voltage will almost be zero. Current will be also rising uh, in intervals of 66%. So a better, more accurate line will be something like this, to where this it will be 66% of whatever the total current is going to be. And this is an increase of 66% of, of whatever is left over. The five times constants, they happen very, very fast in a fraction of a second. When the inductor gets its voltage or rather uh, field uh, expanded, electrons start flowing faster and faster until finally they reach a maximum point where electrons are actually flowing. This is acting, is consuming all the uh, power and this becomes just in essence a piece of wire once the, uh, or will act as a piece of wire once we have reached the maximum flow of electrons to it. And that's why one of the reasons would they say that inductors pass DC voltage. Because at the beginning, it, in, in the first fraction of a second, it stops the voltage, but then after the field expands, it allows all the full current flow and it's like if there was no inductor there. Let's watch this animation to see this illustration. <laughs> 